there it is. What I, I read your mind. <laughs> All right, got it. Um, well, thank you for joining us for this county fair session in August of 2021. We are going to be talking about Friends of the San Juans and the San Juan Preservation Trust and how these organizations work together, uh, how they're different, how they partner, how they hope to partner, and all that good stuff. Uh, thank you for being here. And I really, I, I, I hope to have this be driven by y'all's questions, sort of like, you know, this is a small group, so it allows us to have a pretty good conversation about what's on your mind and, and so on. So let me start with an acknowledgement. Friends of the San Juans honors the fact that this beautiful place we call home is comprised of the ancestral lands and waters and natural resources of the Coast Salish peoples. And the Coast Salish peoples have cared for and stewarded the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea since time immemorial, and they continue to do so. And we honor their inherent Aboriginal and treaty rights that have been passed down from generation to generation. You know, that, that notion of stewardship is, I think, why we're here, right? And I think that there are um, lots of ways, actually, that our, our, these two organizations work together. Um, our, I, I'll just give the sort of 10-second version of Friends of the San Juans and then turn it over to Craig for um, his uh, introductory remarks as well. You know, at, for Friends of the San Juans, our mission is to protect and restore the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea for people and nature. We have been um, going through a strategic planning process in the last six months, and it has helped us focus on, you know, what's important and what we want to do moving forward. And certainly something that's come out of that is the importance of environmental stewardship for our islands and the Salish Sea moving forward, and also being um kind of bringing to the forefront climate action um and i think that those i think those are themes that are going to appear in uh today's conversation um and and i'll stop talking and craig what are let, say hello and 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 talk a little bit about the san juan preservation trust yeah hi um so since this is a virtual fair and um i'm wondering what kind of virtual weather we're having i'm i'm gonna say that it's, it's we're having a nice gentle rain virtual virtual rain right now just to kind of dampen things a little bit and um so um the, yeah the, the san juan preservation trust as as i think everyone on this call knows is um ha, well both organizations were founded in the same year in 1979 uh, and for many of the same reasons um and we'll talk about how we took different paths towards essentially the same goals uh, at the, you know, when, when the organizations were founded, but um, the mission of the Preservation Trust revolves around three C's, uh, conserve, care, and connect. Uh, our mission is to conserve the natural beauty, vital ecosystems, and unique character of the San Juan Islands for future generations, to care for the lands and waters under our protection with our partners, and to connect people to nature, to each other, and the Preservation Trust. Um, that mission is sort of new. We, we went through a strategic planning process in 2018, uh, shortly after our new executive director, Angela Anderson, arrived on the scene. Um, that was like immediately she was plunged into this big strategic planning process. And uh, you know, the two first two C's, conserve and care, are things that, that the Preservation Trust, of course, has, has always done. Um, that is to, to conserve land through um, legal agreements called conservation easements, as well as through outright acquisition of land, uh, and to steward the land. That's the, the, the middle C. And, and we also have uh, traditionally done lots of, you know, field trips, events for members, um, educational activities and so on, um, which we kind of elevated um, to mission critical status with the addition of the third connect C. So, um, and we are, um, yeah, I'll just stop stop there and see what, what may unfold through our conversation. Yeah, thank you. And, and, um, I wanted, if it's okay, since there's just a couple people here, 
Janet and Michael and um, person by phone, if you are able to uh, join the conversation, I'd love to hear sort of what's on your mind and what you what questions you are hoping to get answered um, at, over the course of the next hour. Uh, Janet, you've got your hand up already. What's on your mind? Uh, and Craig, Craig, you've got. Uh, I was just going to point out Janet that had, Janet had her uh, her hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Janet. Oh, thank you. I've been really pleased with the synergies between our organizations where um, the Friends of the San Juans identified especially uh, important segments of the shoreline. And then the uh, Preservation Trust worked to um, get easements. And we tried to cluster this in neighborhoods so that there was connection between parcels. Um, and so it's, it's a more effective way of trying to protect the um, shoreline habitats. And I, I wondered, are there any more of those in the works? Okay, so asking about what are the future prospects for partnerships like that? Thank you, we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Michael, are there questions that you're hoping to get answered um, as we head into this? You know, let me begin by saying I've been familiar with the San Juan Preservation Trust ever since I set foot on Orcas Island, or at least ever since I bought property because uh, the property I had, or I have now, was originally owned by Ray of Ray's Pharmacy. And it was two lots. And he deeded one of those lots to the San Juan Preservation Trust. There's a right behind me and provides a wonderful natural barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not surrounded by neighbors. I'm surrounded by a lot of greenery. Second thing I'd like to say, I've known Craig for a while too. And as, uh, uh, he is a fellow author in this Sloan Technology series. He has a book called Dream Reaper. Mine was Crystal Fire. This is a very auspicious, uh, excuse me, this is a very authoritative uh, series of books on the history of technology. Anyway, uh, the question I would like to get into is to get a better understanding of how uh, the San Juan Preservation Trust does its communications work. We are, you know, as part of our uh, strategic planning process, we're looking at a fairly important expansion in those kinds of activities. And you know, how do I organize them, say, under a director of communications would be an important uh, help that we could have. Thank you. That's a great uh, question. And um, let me turn it over to our person joining by phone. <clears throat> you are able to unmute yourself and um, let us know what's on your mind and, and you'd like to do that. Now's a good time for that. I'm not very good with phones, so I don't, I don't know how to tell someone to unmute themselves. Um, Michelle, are you hosting? Uh, you might be able to uh, ask the person to unmute. Um, maybe it's Eileen. Maybe, maybe Eileen decided to call in if she was having difficulty uh, connecting by computer, but she's still muted so all right well let's let's keep going um craig do you want to uh start off and you can talk about michael's question and um you know i i think the the segue for me too in addition to the specific question he was asking is also sort of how from your chair do you see um you know how, how do two organizations work together productively for something like a joint project and and um you know how do we uh not step on each other's toes and also complement each other's work in, in the communications realm specifically well kind of maybe to address um janet's question first uh and what you just mentioned Brent, about work, how, how do we work together i think um the example of of Tina Whitman um, and the science that she has leads at Friends, and is particularly with respect to locating um, areas of of um, salmon and forage fish habitat in, in the near shore. Um, so we're able to make use of that, um, the maps and and research that based on that work, and try to proactively. Um, protect that land um, primarily through conservation easements with working with the landowners, the private landowners, uh, uh, 
uh, and a great example of that is a, a, a conservation easement that fell into place last year um, in uh, southern Lopez Island, where a lot of these places are actually. Um, this was on Mud, Mud Bay, and it's actually called, uh, the, the, the property is known as Mud Bay Tree Farm. And I had a, we made a video um, about that project, and I was hoping to have, I had to suddenly change computers because the other one wasn't connecting to, to Zoom. And I had, I had these things all loaded up on my other computer to share the, the link with in chat. But um, I think uh, for one thing, oh, that's it. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so we're, um, we're making, and then to sort of jump quickly to, to one of Michael's questions or part of it is, you know, how, how we communicate. We're, you know, we started out in um, March of 2020. Uh, we had this very uh, extensive list of events that we'd planned. And suddenly, you know, the, the whole thing was went out the window with uh, the shutdown, um, uh, old, you know, a year and a half ago almost. And so we thought, well, what can we do? So we started making these little teeny videos, we call them just a minute videos, and they were very deliberately um, simple, you know, I mean, low production values, you know, handheld phones and so on, but, but and just one minute covering various aspects of, of nature and particularly kind of things that, that people could, uh, if they're privileged enough to, to own land or have a backyard, uh, things that they could actually observe uh, in their own neighborhood or, or backyard um, and not have to travel in order to, you know, go to a preserve, for example, or a state park. Uh, so we made a whole series of these and we've been kind of ramping up our, our production, our in-house video production capability. Um, and we were very lucky to have some extremely skilled volunteer videographers who've, who've allowed us to, um, another example is a, a video that we made for our, our annual meeting last year about a false bay at, at low tide um, with a, a guided a guided tour of the, the intertidal uh, and the um, invertebrates um, that lurk beneath the mud and the sand um, and in tide pools. So anyway, um, we decided to kind of do, do more about visual communicating. Um, and I'm a, an old, you know, like you, Michael, I'm kind of an old journalist, a print journalist, mostly, mostly magazines. And so, the, I, you know, I've been, I'm an old dog learning some new tricks, um, um, you know, and with, with video production, but we're, we're trying to um, tell more and more of our stories that way. Um, another re more recent example um, of our work, kind of the same model as the Mud Bay Tree Farm is in McArdle Bay. Um, we just received a grant from the, um, the Salmon Recovery Funding Board, but, uh, AKA the Surf Board, um, which is a state um, part of the, uh, is, a, is a state grant making body. Um, we applied for and received um, grant money to purchase a, cons a bargain sale conservation easement on a property on McArdle Bay that has similar um, kind of salmon recovery features that, that the Mud Bay Tree Farm property had. So that was another and quite recent. I mean, this just fell into place like last last week that we we learned that we had this funding was coming our way. So anyway, that's just a few examples. And um, we have a McArdle Bay video too that I'll be making public shortly. Nice. I, and I got to say, I really love those minute long videos you did last year. Um, I thought those were cool. I watched a bunch of them um, and it was a... I don't know, it was fun. When I was feeling uh, overwhelmed by my new job, I was able to watch those and go, oh yeah, but they're kind of inspirational, you know? I, I, so nice job on those. I thought those were neat. Great. You know, Great. another um, area, Janet, your question again was about um, what's coming up and what's in the future for 
the partnership between the San Juan Preservation Trust and Friends of the San Juans. And there's two things that come to mind for me. One is that, and, and Craig, if I say this wrong or you have corrections, let me know. But my understanding is that the San Juan Preservation Trust is, is, is launching a new conservation planning effort uh, to sort of create their strategic conservation plan for the coming years. And we're helping with that. We are, um, uh, it's, um, oh gosh, it's Vicki Edwards, right? Who's the conservation director at San Juan Preservation Trust? Yeah. So Vicki and Tina have been working together. Tina has been providing some technical expertise and shoreline maps, right? The, the shoreline maps can help identify which shorelines are priority in terms of forage fish habitat and other you know, ecosystem benefits and so on. And, and so our data right now is, is, is an active part of that conservation planning that the San Juan Preservation Trust is doing, which is really cool. Yeah, um, there is. And, so, and so that's one thing, right? So that, that, that work will continue. And, and what's neat about that too is that, um, you know, that will create opportunities, that strategic thinking on the part of the trust will create opportunities to get more grant funds, I think, in the future for protection of critical uh, spots. Uh, so that's, I, that's exciting. You know, another thing that comes to mind, and I, and I really have to um, give the trust some credit here for this. I, it, my, my understanding is that um, in, in years past, kind of, you know, going back more than just the last few years, the, the trust has focused very specifically on the land, right? And that, and that, um, you know, setting aside parcels or portions of parcels through conservation easements, working with San Juan County through the land bank and so on, right? Um, and I think what I've, what I've seen and what I'm hearing is that in recent years, the trust has really begun to recognize that, that um, conserve and, and kind of protection mandate that, uh, that, that they feel towards these properties um, can, can sometimes extend to other threats to those properties, right? Um, and, it, and it may mean dipping their toes into the waters of the advocacy a little bit. Um, and so I know that the Preservation Trust has signed on to a letter here and there, right, to sort of advocate for protections. Um, Janet, in your chat just now, you mentioned Vendovi Island. Um, and I, I bring this up in part because just within the last couple of weeks, there's been an announcement of rulemaking changes about how shipping vessels do bunkering and how they do the refueling and that kind of thing. Um, and Vendovi Island is a great example of a place where, um, you know, refueling happens right, right there. Um, and Vendovi cool. Anchorage, in fact, right, right offshore of Vendovi. Yeah, yeah, Vendovi Anchorage, right. And, and, and th that is a, like that, you know, and I don't know that these conversations have happened yet because this just, this was just announced within the last few weeks, but that's a really good example of a, of a place where, you know, as a landowner, right, the San Juan Preservation Trust has Vendovi Island um, conservation easement uh, you know, legal agreements in place, right? And so that protection, because because it's really important, right? It's really important that those refueling operations are done in a safe way that, that minimizes the risk in every way to those nearby shorelines, right? And that's Vendovi Island, right? The nearby shoreline is Vendovi Island. Um, and, and then also by extension, the, the ecosystems, right? The salmon and the orca and all of that, like, helping make sure that the Salish Sea shipping is safe and protects our ecosystems, I think is something that both of our organizations really share as a priority. Um, and so that's been, that's been cool. I think, I think those are, there's going to be more and more, you know, as shipping increases in the Salish Sea, right? Um, there's going to be more and more opportunities for that kind of um, partnership. I, I, all right, I'll, I'll stop talking now. I see some hands are raised. Yeah, I, can I uh, say something about the Vendovi Island? Please. Because uh, I, I wonder how much of its activities uh, in the San Juan Preservation Trust extend, extends beyond the shoreline. I know ours does. Uh, there was a, an opportunity to comment on this uh, bunkering uh, or stationing of, uh, 
of uh, the tankers. And, uh, you know, Lebel was very active in that a few years ago. It was before your time, Brent, okay? Yeah, and we've talked about it, though. I know we have a, you know, we have a pretty extensive activity beyond the shores in which maybe it could be complementary to what the San Juan Preservation Trust is doing, throwing that out. Yeah. Um, just to comment briefly, um, you know, the, the Preservation Trust is primarily a, a land conservation organization, yeah. land trust. And so, you know, over the years, um, um we've been accused of, of mission creep if we start to think too much th think too much about about the water which is i think um actually um what we have managed to do i think is to communicate uh and educate and and persuade people that the land and the water are of course inextricably uh linked and in fact i mean at low tide you know <laughs> what was water is becomes land and um yeah. and so these examples of, of of shoreline protection in particular uh speak to the importance that the preservation trust play places on on um, salmon recovery and the role that we as land owners and land conservators and um and holders of conservation easements that place restrictions on activities on the land that we protect um you know that that the, that Sam, you know, we're, we are connected to the orcas um, through, through what happens on the land. So um, it's, and, and I think shoreline has become more and more of a, pri uh, shoreline parcels have become more and more of a priority um, over the last 10 years uh, for the Preservation Trust. And they will what to be- What, a, what a, I'm getting at is that we have particular expertise at the water's edge in terms of Tina, and yep. uh, you know fossil fuel transport in terms of level that we can bring to the table and coordinate with the interests of San Juan Preservation Trust. Oh yeah, for sure, absolutely. And we're grateful to you that you do that kind of advocacy. Um, you know, I think harkening back to 1979 and all that, and and the the um, the the alarm that many people in the islands were feeling. Uh, maybe a little bit like the alarm we're feeling now about the pace of, of, of development. And, in, and at that time, there, there was no uh, land use planning on the county level. Um, there, and there was no mechanism really by which land could be uh, directly protected. Uh, the, the, the Nature Conservancy was more active here in the islands at that time, and they played a, an early role protecting some um, some land uh, on Waldron Island, uh, Yellow Island, they still uh, own and manage, um, and a few other places where they actually decided to get out of the what they called postage stamp conservation and um, transferred some of the titles to those properties to the Preservation Trust after it was founded uh, as kind of the local land conservation. And this was, of course, before the land bank uh, was established in 1990. Uh, so, yeah, but, you know, we specifically took a non-political uh, kind of role that had to do not with regulations and government actions, it had to do with private land conservation, um, you know, voluntary, um, non-tax supported, um, you know, private land conservation, whereas the friends, fortunately, took the complementary approach, which was to concentrate very much on the, you know, the, for, I believe one of the first things y'all did was to comp, help to establish the first comprehensive plan at the, uh, with the county, and you're working hard on, on trying, on continuing that work right now, and, um, you know, that's so important, and we're so grateful that, that you're, you know, we got each other's backs, I guess you'd say, in different ways. Yeah. Michelle, you've had your hand up for a little bit. Yeah, I just wanted to pop in a couple of questions that came from someone who was unable to attend this morning. Um, and ironically, you kind of touched on both of the, the questions here, but um, Friends works in the marine and intertidal area. 
Preservation Trust works on land primarily. So where is the overlap and greater potential for partnerships? And do you want the second question or do you want to try to wrap anything around that first one? Can I jump in? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I think we've we've addressed a lot of the second one, right? About what the what the partnerships are um, and what they can be in the future. Um, you know, I I I have heard that before, right? The uh, friends is in the water and and the trust is on the land. And I wanna um, I feel like that's a misconception. I feel like it's it's um, sort of selling both organizations short a little bit, right? We just heard Craig talking about how the trust does realize that there's a connection between what happens on the land and the water and that, that you know, for them, shorelines and salmon and orca and all of that is, is, is part of their priority and part of what they work on. And for us, you know, I think, for us, I think the misconception that where the water comes from the very visible and awesome projects that we do on shoreline, um, on shoreline recovery, shoreline kind of boosting the, the function of those shoreline ecosystems to benefit both the terrestrial environments and the marine environments and the food webs and everything else, right? Like that's, we get, we, we get some headlines for those projects from time to time, but so much of what we do is focused on the land. Um, and we don't own land like the Preservation Trust does or like the land bank does. We, we work to protect the land though through a number of different programs that we do. And one of them is the comprehensive plan update that you just mentioned, right? Like that is all about land. Um, and there's, and there's, there's marine elements into that too, but boy, um, I spend a lot of my day, uh, depending on whether or not the planning commission is having a meeting this week or not, you know, I, I spend a lot of my day talking about protection of critical habitats on land and, you know, how do we make sure that development in the San Juan Islands is happening in a thoughtful and environmentally sensitive way. Um, same thing with our education programs. We've got a, a, a number of different programs that we do with, with high school kids, especially, um, but, but dipping our toes in the middle school as well. Um, you know, mentoring and uh, teaching them about marine food webs through virtual reality experiences and so on. Like, I, I, I say marine food webs, but the programming, the education programming is about all of it, right? It, it is environmental stewardship writ large for our communities. And those are not just the islands, but the whole Salish Sea. And I think, you know, and I think, I think that the Preservation Trust too is, is really about um, the bigger picture of the environmental vitality of, of this area, right? Um, so, I mean, thank you for, I, I appreciate that question. I appreciate the chance to talk about that a little bit. Um, Janet, or Craig, was there anything you wanted to add to that? And Janet's got her hand up as well. Um, I think you covered it well, Brent. I, um, I mean, another kind of related example where our work has, has dovetailed is on shoreline armoring. Um, and you know we work with landowners to, and, and in many cases, if, if there is shoreline armoring, we you know we we try to suggest ways that uh, well we point out how it might be a good idea to reconsider um, uh, that that type of shoreline treatment and and the the friends has uh, developed some specific technical material that speaks to the issue of how you can. Um, you know, how you can uh, kind of re remodel your shoreline to turn it back to nature. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just another uh, kind of where the land and the water meet sort of, sort of situation where we've worked together. I'd like to pop in the other question from this person, if that's okay, and then follow, or Janet, does your question relate to what we're talking about? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to mention my, perspective on why it seems San Juan Preservation Trust was more land and Friends of the San Juan's more shoreline. It's partly because our, of our focus on salmon and forage fish and orcas. And there aren't many salmon bearing streams in San Juan County, but the Preservation Trust has acquired the Coho Preserve, 
on Argus Island near Olga, and there are salmon there now. Um, it's actually the the land bank. Oh, oh sorry, it's the land uh, bank. <laughs> you're you're right. Nice. Yeah, yes. there it, yeah, it's, it's the right. land bank. Anyway, it's very exciting um, for me. But those coho and the little juvenile chinook that are hanging out there too need water. Um, a, a, a reliable water supply from Cascade Creek. And um, I'm, okay. I'm worried now, now that the resort's for sale, the new owners might not be on, um, what do they call it? Team Coho, <laughs> like the current owners are. <clears throat> yeah, the, you know, the land bank has uh, hired a, 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 bio, a, a fish biologist, um, Jenny DeGroot, who's also, if you live on Arcus, you might, you know her from the library, because uh, she works there too, but she's actually monitoring the uh, water levels on Cascade Creek regularly uh, in order to make sure that something ha does not happen again. It happened a few years ago where the, too much water was diverted from from the the, the creek and um, and a lot of salmon died as a result. Um, so so protecting that active stream is, is very important, but, but that's not the only way that, um, I mean, all of our shoreline parcels uh, help to some degree to filter, you know, filter runoff um, like this one on um, property. Uh, well, we're working on um, uh, the Richardson Marsh, it's called, and again, on Southern Lopez Island, right off of Davis Bay. Uh, and the, the largest drainage, the lar largest watershed on Lopez Island um, flows through that marsh and from there into Davis Bay, uh, which is uh, full of eelgrass and other uh, habitat for forage fish and, and juvenile salmon. So, so it's that, it's not just the stream, active salmon bearing streams th that are important, it's, it's that um, riparian barrier you know, or um, borderline uh, and the filtration that we we need to preserve natural vegetation on all of our shorelines to, to help um, make sure that the water flowing into this uh, into, into the ocean is um, you know a, as clean as possible um, so and it's worth noting the, and it's, it's worth noting the statistic that I got from the San Juan Preservation Trust, I think, and correct me, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I believe that something like 90%, over 90% of the shoreline properties in San Juan County are privately owned, right? So that is very telling in terms of how do you, you know, in the big picture sense, how do you achieve healthy shorelines? You got to be working with those private landowners, like because otherwise you're just working with a very small fraction. If you're just looking at the public land, it's not enough. I just wanted to say welcome to Bruce, um, who just joined us a little while ago. Hey, hi, Bruce. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Bruce. Hello. Oh, and I'm sorry I'm late. I had my head down doing something else and just lost track of time. Sorry about that. No worries, Bruce. Glad you could join us. Um, so I have one other question. You guys have both touched on the potential answer, and that was that um, someone wanted to know if you could quickly define the expertise that each organization holds or the differences in expertise and how you share um, that information with each other. Either of you would like to start? You want to you want to start, Brent? Uh, if you'd like to, go ahead. Well, um, I guess I was you know we talked a little bit about how how um, you know the basic uh, the scientific survey shoreline surveys and things like that 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 Tina is leading um, directly feeds into our our conservation plan and our, our former conservation director who retired last year, Debbie Clausen, worked very closely with, with Tina and our new, uh, uh, we have a fabulous new conservation director, Vicki Edwards, um, who joined us from Five Valleys Land Trust in Montana. Um, so she, she's quickly learning about marine environments and marine uh, and shoreline 
protection. That was one thing she didn't really um, do much of in, in Montana, except, um, you know, river, some um, rivers and so on. But um, we have uh, we have a lot of legal expertise because we're drawing up these legal arrangements, conservation easements. We, we the preservation trust now holds close to three hundred um, conservation easements that encompass an area of land about the size of Lopez Island. If you were to add it all together, um, wow. and um, well, that actually includes some of the the preserves that we own as well, but. Um, but which are also protected by conservation easement. But, but, but these easements um, are constantly, every one is different. Um, and and the, the, the kind of the, um, we're thinking more and more now about maybe altering, you know, thinking, especially with, with as we become more conscious of and um, aware of, well, um, you know the fact that the land that we that we own and protect was actually land that was um, taken from um, the indigenous tribes, um, and so we uh, are working more, trying to work more with tribes. Uh, for example, um, there was a transaction last year that involved Haida Point on Orcas uh, near West Sound. Um, uh, that that was actually transferred to to the Lummi, um, the, the Lummi Nation. Um, but our conservation easements are, you know, um, when we did, when we worked with the Lummi, on one aspect of that, I mean, you know, the concept of of ownership and uh, real estate law is not one that, you know, that, that's that's an outgrowth of the European. Um, you know, mindset, the Western mindset that um, is kind of commodif tends to commodify things in order to, uh, uh, and, and, and so the idea that we, that we, the conservation, uh, well, preservation trust would in some way be able to enforce or tell the Lummi like how to manage their land, land that was in fact theirs, uh, and they're a sovereign nation. I mean, these things don't don't add up. They don't they don't compute. And so we're 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 trying to think more creatively and broadly about how we can um, work together with tribal entities in a way that doesn't uh, that respects their their rights and their knowledge and their um, their precedence on the land and uh, with and and still um, ensure permanent conservation and within the legal framework that we all live in, uh, while also you know acknowledging tribal um, sovereignty and and so on. So, so that's I I just kind of got into the legal you know th there's a lot of legal acts. Um, our, our our executive director and Angela Anderson is an attorney and. Um, we, um, we, we spend a lot of money um, uh, working with uh, attorneys who have expertise in, in uh, conservation law. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, you, you, we, we've mentioned already a couple of times that the question is about the expertise of the organizations, right? And um, we've mentioned a couple of times the data that Friends of the San Juans can provide the San Juan Preservation Trust in terms of identifying conservation hotspots in the, in the San Juan Islands and the Sailor Sea, right? Like, you know, what is the data? What what is the data? What what do the data tell us about where are the forage fish spawning, and you know how much? And you know, as we said forty years ago, forty two years ago now. Friends of the San Juans began with this effort to um, support long range planning for the county, right? Through that comprehensive plan. And about half, about halfway, 40 years is a long time, about halfway through that period of time, about 20 years ago, Friends really began in earnest focusing on 
shoreline improvements, right? Looking at the ecosystems on shorelines and, and doing projects and working with landowners and taking out bulkheads and, um, you know, watching new permits for new bulkheads and new docks and so on and trying to make sure that those are following the rules and that they, you know, anyway, as we have gone through these, this period, the last 20 years, we have developed tremendous expertise in terms of understanding how these shorelines function in an ecological and in a scientific sense, right? Um, and so pretty much whenever there's a conversation in our county about shorelines and the importance of shorelines and managing shorelines and improving shorelines, we're at the table because we have, you know, we are one of the key experts locally about how that happens and how that works. Um, and, and a lot of that is personified in Tina Whitman, our science director, who's been at Friends for almost 20 years now and has been, you know, working with partners all these years and, and, and learning from other scientists and um, doing the research herself and with the team here at Friends of the San Juan. So um, that's, that's a big one, right? And, and, then, and then these days, it's all, it's all uh, data, right? It's all GIS layers and that kind of thing. Um, and certainly that uh, is something that we're, we've been working on a lot in the last few years is sort of like, how are we translating our data into GIS maps and so on? Um, and then, and then Janet, our board president, uh, put into chat um, reminding us about learning from the tribes as well. And so that is, uh, and and you know, I, I well, I've been at Friends of the San Juans for going on a year now, and certainly within that year. And I know that I know that extending further back in time as well, Friends has been looking at, you know, how can we partner with um, efforts that are happening from the Coast Salish nations. If they've got an, an initiative, is there some way that we can support that? Um, you know, an, an example that I mentioned earlier about those rulemaking changes for bunkering and so on, um, that's, some, that's something where we've got a pretty good history at this point of reaching out to tribes and finding out, you know, kind of where they're at on some of these issues and where, that, where they add on these opportunities and what are their priorities and so on. Um, so we're getting there. We're, it's a learning journey, um, but we're trying to bring that to the front of our work uh, wherever we can. Um, Michelle, is your hand up from before or do you have another? No, I have one more. And this shifts it, we've touched on this a little bit, this shifts it kind of to the education um, pieces between the two organizations. So we have um, a member who says that she is thrilled to see that two such long-standing organizations protecting the environment focus on students. And the collaboration between the two organizations was never more apparent than when the Preservation Trust awarded scholarships to two local students. And they both in their acceptance speeches thanked Friends of the San Juans for the leadership. She was tickled, but she would like to know um, if you can both reveal a little bit more in the time that we have left about what you do for education and youth um, that we don't see besides what she had witnessed in that annual meeting. Craig, go ahead and start again. Well, yeah, you brought up the, the, the scholarships, which are actually call, called the climate leadership scholarships. And the, uh, this was the second year this past spring that we awarded um, two to outstanding um, high school seniors, graduating seniors in the county who, uh, who go to school in the county. Uh, and, um, and yeah, I think both last year and this year, um, those students had, um, had, had participated in, in se you know, sessions that, that I believe Katie um, on your staff uh, had had led and so you know she 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 was very busy katie was writing letters of recommendation for many many of the, the, the top tier of the candidates um so that was delightful um we um we do we bring a lot of of youth to lands um that we protect through the YCC program, the Youth Conservation Corps program. Um, I mean, this year alone, I think we've had, even with COVID, we've had uh, 10 or so 
um, stewardship events where, where, ki where kids come to, uh, to properties like, such as the Ellis Preserve on Shaw Island and participate in a, a, a host of different um, activities, whether it's pulling tansy or brushing the trail, um, helping to make the trail, um, all sorts of different activities that, that and and um, you know they're they're learning as they as they work, um, and we have now on um, a volunteer and outreach coordinator Sierra O'Connell who who did work before directly with the YCC, um, and so she's really an outstanding um, liaison with with youth groups, and we're, we're, we're we intend to do more um, to reach out to various youth organizations that we can partner with um and we we have uh yeah so we, we don't unlike both you and cdoc who have actually have staff and and curricular expertise uh in, in curriculum development we don't have we have not yet or we, we haven't gone down that path but you know it's possible it's it's possible that we're, we're going to start organizational strategic planning again in a, in a in a couple of years and um, who knows uh, wh what might happen. But uh, um, I think primarily we, we do this more experiential on the land kind of um, youth outreach. Yeah, you know, I, I um, when San Juan Preservation Trust does their nature walks on one of the um, one of the properties or, or something like that, you know, I, the the ability for families to participate in those is really powerful. Um, it's not within the formal education program in terms of being in the classroom, right? But that's sort of uh, what they refer to as informal science education is really important. And um, I think in the environmental community nationwide, there's a lot more recognition now of nature deficit disorder and the uh, challenges that can develop for young people if they are developing in the absence of nature, right? And so getting kids well away from their devices and out into nature is really powerful. And I think the San Juan Preservation Trust has been doing a good job of that. Um, and, 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 and I hope to see more of it, right? Like it's, it's, um, it's, those are, there's a lot of fun too. It's always good to bring fun into your work. Um, in terms of Friends of the San Juans, you know, I mentioned that we've gone through the strategic planning process and one of the key that we, we have seven key priorities for our organization and one of them is specifically about education programming. And I think, you know, we, we have programming for community education and, and adult education, that kind of thing, at, I, you know, green boating and landowner education and so on. Um, I think that question was more about kids. Um, and what's going on in, in school programming. And we have programs. So, so on our books already are things like our Cool School Challenge and plastic reduction programs and um, the Immersive Education Virtual Reality Program on Marine Food Webs that I mentioned earlier, um, the student mentorship that um, Katie Fleming does. And, you know, what we there's a couple of ways that we are planning to improve, right? And this is what's come up through our strategic planning. One is to make sure that we're being more diligent about offering those programs. They've been a little bit sporadic for us over the years in terms of, well, we've got some grant funding for this one, so let's do it. Well, we don't have grant funding for that one this year. So, you know what I mean? And, and kind of that stop and start, um, it's a more powerful program if it can be continuous. So we're looking at how we might be able to be more uh, deliberate and um, strategic about making sure we can offer things on an ongoing basis, and then also coordinating those programs with each other. Uh, they've they've sort of operated independently, but certainly if we can bump up the strength of those programs, it makes a lot of sense for them to, for those programs to to function in an integrated way out there in the community in terms of delivering education. Um, we want to do more. We want to do more middle school and high school education programming. We just recently received a grant uh, through the Orcas Island Community Foundation's uh, catalog uh, program, uh, the, the spring catalog, to um, expand our mentorship to Orcas Island, which um, we're excited about. And I was just in a meeting the other day about 
how we're going to pull that off on Orcas for the coming school year, um, especially with COVID. It's complicated, but we're going to figure it out. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing that's come up for us is making sure that moving forward, a lot of what we do is in terms of education with kids is really focused heavily on climate action. Um, you know, and, and maybe this is a good, a good segue into kind of the final moments of this session, but, you know, climate is climate change and climate action and climate resiliency for our community and, and adaptation and mitigation and the whole thing, like the whole package of understanding those changes and how to be ready for them for our community is um, just a critical part, not only of those school education programs, but also everything we do. Right, and I know that that's true for the San Juan Preservation Trust too. You know, if if you're managing land and that and the and the environment is getting hotter and drier, that that brings new challenges to that land management, right? Um, and I I know that for both organizations, you know, we our community is looking to us, right? Our community, the the San Juan the people who live in the San Juan Islands, um, our county government, um, they are looking to the nonprofit organizations that have that expertise around environmental issues and environmental stewardship to be leaders for our community moving forward. Um, it's going to be tough, right? There's going to be a lot of, it's going to be a lot of pain for our community in the coming decades. And, you know, we have, we're both San Juan Preservation Trust and Friends of the San Juans are able to sort of bring the expertise to the table to look ahead and, and start making really good decisions about how we manage ourselves and, and all that. Um, so anyway, thank you. Um, Janet, you're holding something up. I see an owl. Would you, do you want to say anything about that? It's a magazine I subscribe to. Um, the, this whole issue is on living with fire and I ordered 20 copies. Uh, <laughs> why <wildly. laughs> Living with fire, uh, yeah. Um, we've we had a few close calls um, on actually a couple of preserves um, or adjacent to them um, this this past this fire season, and uh, we hope we, we hope they're they're always close calls and never go beyond that. Um, but that's one aspect of climate um, that we are ex obviously experiencing more and more of. Um, around the state and the region. And um, so in our, in our, in our um, conservation strategic plan, uh, you know, climate resiliency is another one of, it's it, like, like a GIS layer. It's a, it's, it, it's a very important um, lens um, through which we're viewing and, and fine tuning our, our conservation focus. Um, so, and, oh, Janet just mentioned Gary Oaksavan is, uh, that's another subject of a video that we, we recently did, um, uh, a whole video about um, what's so big, about, what's the big deal about Gary Oaks? You know, we kind of answer, try to attempt to answer that question and um, go to our website and hopefully you can, if you're, if you're interested. And um, um, that was a fun video to make. I haven't seen it yet. I, 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 I'd like, I'm interested. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go find it. We'll send you the link. Uh, I can't both watch the Zoom screen and like go chasing down <laughs> YouTube links at the same time. I, it's like chewing gum and walking, you know. Yep. So we're coming up on our 11 o'clock mark, actually 11.01. Um, out of respect for everyone's time. I was going to wrap this up. Um, Craig, if that gives you a moment to find your link, <laughs> you can. Otherwise, we can follow up in an email. I want to thank uh, Eileen and Dan for joining us on the telephone. And um, Brent and Craig, thank you so much for your time this morning and answering questions from both those who are here and those who had been unable to make it. Uh, we'll stop recording the meeting here in a moment, and we will be having that available for our members in our community to see. So thank you very, very much, Craig. Do you need just another second to, oh, you got it in there, I see it. Okay, yeah, I will I, make I, sure to. And, and as, we're, 
as we're wrapping up here, Michael, I saw your hand up just as we were finishing. So if you want to stay on for a second, I'm, I'm happy to chat for another minute after we stop the recording. But otherwise, thank you, everybody. And um, appreciate you showing up on a Saturday morning for this. And thank you, Michelle, for organizing. This is such a cool yes. idea to do this together. I, so I was, I was excited at the idea. Thank you, Craig, for participating. It's been hey, awesome. The opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. <laughs>